the writer. I forgot how to turn on the microwave. I knew I'd use the machine a million times. I remembered my first wife scolding me whenever she caught me reheating coffee. Those bits of memory were still solid. But how? How had I turned it on and made it do its job? That was missing. I was 50 years old that morning, too young to be going soft in the head. I studied the calculator like buttons next to the food streaked glass, grasping for it, a writhing unease growing within me. The memory came back in a pop and relief steamed after it, yet as I loaded my burrito it seemed I was doing so for the very first time. The machine's atomic hum sounded alien and when the timer dinged, I flinched from belly to shoulders. It must have been that hard jump that jostled the memories out of the vault. They tumbled into the light, a swirl of forgotten moments, pictures pasted onto shards of glass. A svelte woman stood in the center. Her hair had grayed, but she kept it long and wore it like a rare kind of silver. My grandmother. Nana Ann. She had an old house near Becker Lake and a monster lived inside its walls. I saw it the summer I turned 13, way back in 1979. We were heading to the lake the day it started. I wore swim trunks and flip-flops, a Star Wars towel draped around my shoulders. I waited beside my grandmother's 10-year-old truck because she told me, meet you by Old Blue. The sun blazed on my shoulders. Impatient minutes passed. Finally, I went to see what was taking her so long. A feeling of stifling dread grabbed me as I approached the back door. It descended from the hot air, an invisible python, gripping me from all directions, a foreboding that something had just gone horribly, irrevocably wrong. I was certain of it. Nana smoked cigarettes, after all, and everybody knew that smoking killed you. Sometimes it did it slow, gnawing on your lungs and torturing you. Other times it swooped in and snatched you from the world in a furious grab. I imagined my grandmother a victim of the latter kind of death. She'd had a stroke or a heart attack and dropped dead. The tops of my feet got hot as I gave her another minute to come banging out of the door, a long white cigarette in one hand and her enormous bag slung over one arm at the elbow. She didn't. In the kitchen, lines of sunshine broke through the closed blinds and cast bars on the floor. She was not, thankfully, dead on the linoleum. Rather, she was sitting on the edge of her bed, holding brown sunglasses. She stared at one corner of the floor or at something small and far away that only she could see. Nana, I said. She looked up and at me, her expression a squinting mass of sadness and dazed confusion. James? Yes. I shifted my stance, suddenly aware of what she'd look like when she was truly old and too tired to make her hair shine. The thought filled me with a hollow cold. Are you okay? She blinked the aged visage away, returning to her normal self. An old woman, yes, but one who wore bright colored clothes, smelled like suntan lotion all year round, and drove a lifted four wheel drive. I came in here looking for these. She waved the sunglasses at me. And I completely forgot what I was doing. Has that ever happened to you? No, I said, still a bit weirded out. Her lips curled into a smile, signaling that she was about to spit one of her favorite curses. Then she did and I giggled like a much younger child. Let's get a move on. Let the day get away and it always will. We spent the afternoon on Becker Lake. My skin had lost the melanin it needed to tan and, in spite of the coats of sunscreen she layered on me, I was a tingly pink that evening. She was more worried about it than I was. I burned before and always healed. After dinner, we sat on her back porch. She drank gin and tonics. I slurped soda through a straw and ate potato chips out of the bag, coating my fingers in a greasy salt. It was midnight when she sent me to bed. Ah! Can't let you stay up all night, she said, standing up. Your mom would give me hell. I won't tell her. She'll still know. She gave my arm a little tug, getting me moving. She's like that, has been all her life. Teeth brushed, pajama bottoms on. I slid between the down-filled comforter and cotton sheets, certain that I'd be awake for hours, restless and staring into the shadows. Instead, I started to doze right away. Then it happened, I heard the monster in the walls, 
a sound like nimble hooves moving at a full gallop. The noise roused me to wide-eyed attentiveness and sudden fright ballooned in my chest. I listened. Waited. And all at once I was peacefully unalarmed and sinking into sleep. It's nothing. Then I was gone. For a while, nothing bad happened. Nana towed her little boat to the lake for hours of fishing. We caught nothing but seaweed. Then she taught me how to row. Working the oars was harder than I'd imagined and, when my muscles gave out, she zipped us back to shore. Nothing to it, she said, her boisterous laugh skipping across the water. Most days, she let me explore the back end of her property. Aside from the black squirrels that chased each other through the trees, I was utterly alone in those dense, quiet woods. I obeyed her order not to go past the creek that fed Becker Lake, yet still felt bold and grown up. In the evenings, Nana gave me cooking lessons. If you want to be a good husband, learn your way around the kitchen. She showed me how to crush raw tomatoes and turn them into an orange spaghetti sauce that tasted better than what came from jars. Every evening, we ate dinner on her back porch. Days passed and my limbs turned a healthy gold. My sunburn healed, too, except for one tender spot in the middle of my back. Every night, I slept fast and deep. Then the monster woke me up again. For a second or two, I lingered in a witless daze, unsure of where I was and what had pierced my sleep. Then I recognized the walls of Nana's guest room and her old dresser. A split second later, I heard the noises again, a thumping sound, like a team of horses pulling a wagon behind the walls. A light was on somewhere in the house. It cast a thin, white triangle beside my door and pushed a sickly glow into the room. I crept out of the blankets, instantly overcome by the abnormal cold in the room. Nana stood in the living room. Her cigarette sent concentric circles of smoke into the air. A shawl of cold settled on me making me hunch and cross my arms over my chest, holding in my body heat. Did you hear it, too? She asked. Her eyes seemed dot disheveled, full of both confusion and a wild fear. The look was worse than what she'd had when she'd gone to her bedroom and forgotten that she was looking for her sunglasses. It's not here for you. Her smile looked more like a wrinkled grimace. You haven't lived long enough. I've been around forever and a day and that's exactly what it's after. The noise skittered behind the drywall. It was rhythmic and somehow familiar, definitely made by tiny hooves. Slashes of pain, then his knife blades, crossed between my sunburned shoulder blades as my skin tightened. Hell's bells, she said. I'm not ready. Nowhere close. Ready for what? For the rider, she said. The son of a bitch carried my mother away. He took her bit by bit, night after night, the evil little fucker. With all her curse words spat into the freezing air she sounded crazy, a full-blown lunatic in need of strong pills and a hospital full of doctors. I'm surprised I can even hear the little thief. Her chuckle came out hoarse and wet. As old as I am. The horses thundered through the walls again. They charged harder this time, as if being whipped and driven to move faster. You can help me, she said. Boys know something about courage. They surely do, more than grown men because. The rider, whatever it was, hammered across the ceiling, making me cringe. Because men forget. She leaned down to me, so close her breath was a stale wind against my face. Women do, too. They have to. If they didn't go blind to the riders and all the other bad shit, they'd never be able to make a living or raise their own little ones. But a kid your age, not a little boy, but not quite grown, you can still see them. I trembled. Not just from the cold. From fear, from her crazy talk, the writer, from the recurring din of nonsensical sounds in the walls. It was definitely a team of horses. I'd watched black and white westerns on late night TV with my father. What I'd heard tonight resembled a twisted version of those old soundtracks. It didn't fit with a three-week vacation at Becker Lake. You can, can't you? I stared up at her. The temperature dropped another few degrees. My breath made a cloud of fog. When you were little, you had a monster under your bed. Do you remember? I nodded, agreeing because she sounded frantic and I knew she wanted me to agree, 
but also because I did have a monster under my bed when I was five. Was he make-believe or was he real? Sometimes he was real, I said. Exactly, she said. Children know, they always do. Sometimes the monsters are real. The rider barreled along the middle of the wall, pounding the inside of the drywall so hard I believe the paint would begin to push outward and break off in sharp peels. He wants everything in the vault, she said. I'm not giving it up, not without a fight. No way. We have a vault in the house? We're not Rockefellers. I mean the important vault, the one between here. She tapped her temple. And here. She touched her heart. Thing is, it's got to ransack the whole place to get to what it really wants. The rider shot across the ceiling and down the wall farthest from us, rattling behind the framed pictures of my mother when she'd been a gangly teenager. Nana eyes lifted toward the banging. She looked sharp and focused, hot with anger. Then her expression emptied, as if all of her thoughts were seeping away like water receding from a shore, and she went blank. Nana, I said. She shook her head. I'm here. Her mouth pulled back in an ugly scowl as she scanned the room. What should I do? What? You said I could help you. That's right, she said. Your grandfather left a castanet in the attic. It's up there with his rods and waders. I stepped toward the hallway, then glanced around and saw that she wasn't following. I'll stay here and keep him busy, she said. What's a cast dash? It's for catching bait, she said. You'll know it when you see it. Now be quick, we don't have a lot of time before we're both asleep. I took the stairs three and four at a time and, in the attic, sliced one hand through the air until I found the string for the overhead light. Yellow light filled the room, illuminating the old dust my presence had kicked into the air. Boxes were stacked on one end of the room. A pile of old Christmas decorations on the other. Grandpa's fishing poles were arranged on the wall. I dug into the boxes closest to them, looking for something that seemed made to catch minnows and other tiny fish. The smell hit me then, the scent of unstirred air and forgotten things, ripe with slow-growing mold and stillness. I found a tattered net of green mesh with a long line of rope at its top. Had to be it. Then I sprinted back to the living room. Is this? The light was still on but Nana wasn't in the room. I found her in her bed, curled around one pillow, lightly snoring. Nana. The coldness lifted. Quiet settled in the old house. I padded through the other rooms, making sure nothing hid in the shadows, and turned off the lights in the living room. As I left, I caught a flurry of movement in my peripheral vision, as if a hulking creature was shifting its weight. I knew it was my strained imagination, but it covered my arms in goose flesh. I sat on my bed, holding the cast net in a hard fist, and thought about calling my parents. I didn't know what I'd tell them. Nana had lost her mind, or some part of it. But I pictured my mother hurling my shorts and t-shirts into my carry-on, telling me how important it was to stay connected to my only grandparent. I heard my father explaining what a fantastic growth experience my vacation would be. Their eyes had told me the truth. They needed a break from their boy and time alone with one another. Besides, she was right about the monsters. I hadn't thought about it for a long time, but I'd never forgotten the truth, not entirely, sometimes, the monsters are real. I stayed awake a long time, thinking and worrying. All the while, the house remained quiet. I woke up early, the muscles in my upper back coiled like brittle wire. Nana's house seemed different now. Everything was exactly as it had been before, but I knew it had been invaded. I took the net to the backyard and tried throwing it. Each time, it landed in a flat, tangled heap that not even a stupid fish would get trapped in. Where'd you find that old thing? Nana's sudden presence startled me and her question made me take a step backwards. The attic, I said, almost adding after you send me for it. Let me see it, she said. She arranged the net so that it draped over one hand and gave it a gentle toss. The canopy opened in mid-flight, catching a glint of sunlight as it descended. It settled on the grass in a near-perfect circle. Do something often enough and it becomes a part of you, she said. Your muscles grab hold of memories, 
especially your hands. Any guitar player will tell you, the hands remember everything. Is that the vault? The vault? She gave me a serious look, as if our talk and the freezing cold in the writer had all come back to her. No. That is not the vault. Nowhere close. The vault is something else entirely. What is it, then? Something your grandpa made up, she said. One of his theories, you remember him at all? I had a few hazy memories of my grandfather, a long face and toothy smile, red check shirts and caps. Not really, I said. The two of you would have really gotten along, she said. You want breakfast before or after I teach you how to use that net? After, I said. By the end of her lesson, I tossed the net in near perfect circles, too. Nana seemed to be entirely herself again, full of energy and cheerfully telling me about her fishing trips with my grandfather. I promised myself that I'd bring it all up later, and I meant to do so. I really did. But the events of that night never crossed my mind that day. That night, as I brushed my teeth getting ready for bed, I realized that I'd forgotten everything about the incident, the terrible sound of the horses galloping through the walls, the deathly cold, Nana's angry, frightened eyes. It didn't make sense that such a trauma could melt so quickly. I stayed awake that night, uneasy, and I heard my grandmother in my thoughts, boys know something about courage. But sleep snuck up on me and pulled me into its dreamless void. Days passed. My arms and legs turned the color of old bronze. I barely remembered the rider at all. It seemed he had no more power than a faded nightmare. I spent more hours exploring Nana's property, the squirrels keeping me company. It was after one of those long walks in the woods that I remembered him fully. I entered the house, aware of my childish grubbiness and thinking only of getting to the shower. Nana was standing in the living room staring at the framed photographs. I could tell she hadn't heard me come in because she stayed completely still, fixated on the photo. I saw her in profile and noted the strain in her posture, the way she'd cocked her head and craned her neck at one of the photos. Her hand was in midair, as if she'd started to scratch her head and stopped before she reached the itch. Her fingers trembled, and in that moment, the memory of the writer fully surfaced and chilled me from the inside out. Nana. I said. She glanced around and motioned for me to join her. How old do you suppose your mother was when this was taken? I knew all about the photograph Nana pointed at. It was of my mother when she'd been a skinny girl. Her broad smile showed a gap between her front teeth, a flaw she'd had fixed before I was born. She'd changed so much the rowboat she sat in was more recognizable than she was. That was her birthday, I said, keeping my voice calm. She turned 13. You and Grandpa let her take the boat out by herself. Is that so? You told me all about it. You're right, Nana said, nodding. Yes, I remember. I knew it was a special occasion, but... Guess I'm slipping a little bit. You're not, I said. Her lips clenched together, shooting wrinkles through her cheeks. He's got to ransack everything. Now that the memory was as loud as my own thudding heart, the fact that I'd forgotten him shocked me. I heard all the terrible sounds again, the little hooves stampeding in the walls. It had come, I knew, and taken Nana's memory of her only daughter's 13th birthday, leaving a hollow gap in its place. I swallowed a hard lump in my throat and wondered what else it had stolen while we slept. I know what you're thinking, Nana said. You want to take the boat out all by yourself don't you? I'd been thinking only of the writer, but a subject change seemed like a good idea and I made myself smile. Can I? Absolutely not, she said, placing one hand on her hip. Boys at 13 are still, well, boys. Next year, though. Maybe. That night, I kept the cast net in bed with me, gripping it the way a child holds a beloved stuffed animal and in those silent minutes I relived everything that had happened. I remembered that I'd heard him early in my vacation. He'd scared me, but I'd sunk into a blissful slumber, as if too tired to be bothered. We don't have a lot of time before we're both asleep. My breathing turned ragged as I pondered his dark power. I imagined him in Nana's room, 
reining in his horses and dismounting his wagon to stand over Nana, ransacking her. I ground my teeth together and prepared for the rider. I was wide awake when the blast of chilled air entered the house. The smothering drop in temperature wrung all the energy out of me, sending me plummeting toward sleep in a fast drift. But the determined, vengeful part of me remembered. I forced my eyes open, rubbed at my nose, and slapped my forehead. I heard the hooves pounding the inner walls, such tiny horses, all galloping in a rage. Nana's bedroom door was closed. I stood near it, the nut draped over my arm like she'd shown me, and reached for the doorknob. The same dense fright that had seized me the day Nana had forgotten why she'd entered her bedroom pounced me. I inhaled a sharp breath of icy air. My heart hammered. Shivers attacked my knees and forearms. I stayed there, bare feet riveted to the frozen floor, my awareness turning numb as the dread curled tighter around me. Boys know something about courage, they surely do. I felt none of the bravery she was so sure of, but I held back my tears, forced myself to breath, and turned her doorknob. A ranting wind screeched when I stepped into her bedroom. I took in everything, her long shape under the blankets, the paperback on her nightstand next to a glass of water, all the things I'd known I'd see in my grandmother's bedroom, and then, in a flash, I no longer stood in that familiar place but in a barren cave with walls of jagged, black ice. A fetid smell, sulfuric and rotten, made my eyes water. The image was gone in a flash, but I was sure of two things, it had been real and it had been the vault. The wind continued to howl. Nana let out a pained moan. I prepared the net. The bedroom dissolved as it left my hands. It sailed over a rocky landscape, a coarse floor littered with sharp Dutch stones. The cave contained no light yet some debris on the ground winked and glittered. Broken glass. On my right, Nana was sprawled on a pile of rocks. She was in her nightgown, a dumpy outfit of faded, yellowing material that seemed unworthy of her, and in the same position, but her eyes and mouth were open. She looked hideous like that, a zombie version of her that sickened me and angered me. Beyond her, in the long realm of darkness, a tall man waved from the shadows. He wore a red checked shirt, my grandfather, and he called out, Give him hell, boy, you got him, you got him. Goose flesh skittered across the small of my back. The net landed and the wind screeched, shoving me backwards. Again, I positioned the net for a toss. Nana stirred, feet thrusting in hard twitches. I threw the net again. It sailed an impossible distance. I grabbed the lead line's handle the second before it left the crook of my elbow. This time, when I drew it toward me, I felt it snag. I'd caught something that felt like seaweed on a fishing line, a dull, wet weight. Then it began to squirm, resisting, and my heart lurched because I knew I had the monster. I pulled back on the line, straining to yank it toward me, and back backpedaled for what I hoped was her door. It occurred to me that I could become lost in the cave, the vault, and become trapped in its non-reality. I pulled anyway bringing the nut to me jerk by jerk, inch by inch, until it was near my feet. I couldn't see it clearly. The cave was too dark. I made out that it contained something solid and, in that second, parts of it slithered behind the mesh, a gob of writhing drudge. The smell intensified, overwhelming me, forcing me to walk backwards. It seemed I'd taken ten times as many steps backwards as I had when I'd entered. A mad fear bounced around my head. The notion that I was already lost in the cave, that I'd spend the rest of days here with my captured rider. Then I felt carpet under one foot and the cave was gone, replaced by hallway walls adorned with framed photographs. I gave the nut a final tug and made it tumble from the bedroom. I could have seen it then. Enough moonlight filled the room to let me. But I didn't look. I couldn't. When I dropped to one knee and gathered it in my hands, I kept my gaze away from it as if afraid to meet its eyes. I felt its enormous weight though, like carrying a hostile, well-fed octopus capable of murder, and I caught the full strength of its smell. I fled the house holding the net around its weighted end, keeping the rider, whatever it was, locked in place. I leapt from Nana's back porch, vaguely aware of muggy air against my legs. Someone was crying babyishly and, as I reached the creek that fed Becker Lake, I realized it was me. 
13 was, in that second, still a little boy. I stuffed the net into the creek, holding the monster below its surface. It thrashed. Some part of it lapped at my fingers, sticky and rough like sandpaper, a bit like a cat's tongue, but thicker and slower. It fought less than a minute and then went soggy and limp. I held it there regardless, becoming more aware of my own pitiful crying. She wasn't ready, I told it. Not yet, not by a long shot. My hands went numb. I choked back my sobs, got control of my breathing, and slowly brought the net out of the water, bracing myself for whatever dead thing was inside it. It moved easily though and water cascaded from its empty mesh. I got to my feet, wiping at my cheeks, unsure if I drowned it or if it had gotten away, and something rose from the creek into the air like a shadow, solid enough to catch my attention. Instinctively, I looked up and stared at the rider. The monster was a man-shaped shadow, at least ten feet tall and broad-shouldered. He wore mammoth cowboy hat like a crown. Its brim was long and curved upwards in tight coils. I heard horses snorting. The sound was muffled and far away. I stared another moment, fully aware that its blank face was studying me, perhaps memorizing my face, and then it peeled away both lifting into the sky and sinking into the little river, like it had been nothing but a shadow. Sometimes the monsters are real. The terrible smell of sulfur dissipated and the air went clean. I sat down beside the creek, exhausted, and rested my head in my hands. Then I let the tears flow. I cried for Nana and for everyone who had a rider, but no boy to help them. I cried for a grandfather I barely remembered and for my own pitiful self. When I finished, the sun had turned a thin strip of horizon to a chalky orange color. I headed back to the house, planning on sneaking back into my bed. Then I found the squirrels. They were on the ground, seven dead bodies, black hands twisted upwards as if still fighting. They were frozen, their bead-like eyes turned fish belly white. I took quite steps around them. When I got to the back porch, Nana waited at the railing, and she looked angry. You shouldn't have done that, she said. But. It was dangerous, she said. I stared at my bare feet, my throat dry and an itchy tiredness nabbing at me. It was also brave, she added. Guess I got a few more good years left, thanks to you. Lots more than a few. She motioned at the porch steps and I joined her, resting against her like I was a kinder gardener the full burden of what had happened prying up a fresh set of tears. Don't be sad when it comes back and gets me. I won't let it, I said. If it's not him, it'll be one of his friends. Something gets us all, one way or the other. That's just the way of this world. I wanted to argue, but no rebuttals came to mind. This is for your vault, James. In the morning, it'll feel like a dream and by this time tomorrow it'll be gone. You let it stay that way, you hear? So that's the vault? Part of it, she said. Someday, you're going to fall head over heels for somebody and that person's going to rip your heart in two. It's going to hurt so bad you'll think you can't go on. But you will, because the pain will slide into the vault. It always does. All you have to do is let it. You understand? I wiped snot from my nose and rubbed my hand against my pajama bottoms. I'll have to leave you one day, she said. I won't like it, but I'll have no say about it. Same goes for your parents. That'll hurt, too, and your job will be to let it find its way into the vault. Everything too terrible to know and all of the heartbreaks and sorrows have to go there. The sooner you let them settle and lock them away, the better. I started to say yes, ma'am the way I replied to my mother when she scolded me in front of my father. I held it back, though, because this was not a lecture, this was adult knowledge of monumental importance. Usually, all it takes is time for them to fade away to nothing, she continued, her voice solemn. Some bad happenings have barbs on them. They get stuck in you, make it so you can't let go of them. That's when you have to work at opening the vault. Remember that. I will. Promise? I promise. Good boy, she said, and there's one more thing you need to know. It's the most important part. If the past has a smell, 
It's the scent found in an unused attic full of dust and unmoved air. If you're lucky, you'll catch a whiff of it when you least expect it, because the vault slips open sometimes. In the warm moments between consciousness and a fading dream, when you find yourself shuffling some sad memory so thin it's like vapor, that's the vault. When something reminds you of the one who broke your heart or the friend who left this world too soon, that's the vault door left ajar. I suppose it's giving us a gentle reminder of all that's good in this world and all the happiness worth keeping out of the cave's darkness. Perhaps that the last part Nana told me. The call came one day during my sophomore year of high school, a month after I got my learner's permit. My mother flew out first. My father and I followed two days later. While on the tarmac, waiting to leave the plane, he told me, you don't have to see her if you don't want to. But fifteen and a half is too old to not be brave. Besides, I'd been brave before, so I stepped into her hospital room. Nana laid in bed with her hands folded on her lap. Her eyes were open, fixed in a blank stare, and her silver hair had lost its shine. I hoped she'd notice me and say my name again. James? The clouds stayed put, though, occupying her empty mind. A creeping dismay rumbled below my grief. The remembrances came in jerking fragments, a flash of Nana kissing me on the head, the coo of her voice, good night, brave boy. And waking up the next morning, alarmed to find my feet dirty and bewildered by the cast net on the floor. Then, finally, the vault fully opened and unleashed the sounds of hooves. I trembled at the recollections, momentarily stunned. I knew right then that I'd forgotten the most important lesson of the vault. I was sure she'd told me all about it, and just as certain that it was forever gone, no matter how hard I pondered or tried to recall it. The rest of the memories faded just as quickly as they had surfaced. The tears I shed that day had nothing to do with the evil that I knew. Eight years later, my parents died in a single car accident while on vacation in Utah. They'd set aside a weekend to explore some part of the desert and never reached their destination. As I made the funeral arrangements, the writer's memory taunted me. It'd been one of his wicked friends, I thought, a creature just as just as vicious that craved heartbreaks and sorrows. In the years that passed, the taste of homemade spaghetti sauce always took me back to that summer at Nana's. A low dread usually followed those melancholy reminiscences, but I gave it no mind. I never thought of the writer, or any other monster, again. Grown men forget, as Nana said, and I am no exception. Now, I hear him in my walls, charging behind the drywall, shifting his paws down as he watches me. He's been here for some time now. I have no doubt about that because I'm aware of hollow spaces in my memory. I know my first wife was precious to me and that she died young, but I can't tell you her name or much of what she looked like or how she left this world. The writer carried all of that away. The boy I used to be is out of reach. If I could conjure just a sliver of him, I'd fight the writer again. My cave has a few unexpected hardships and sudden pains tucked in its nooks and shadows all treasures for the writer. I would keep them all, every sudden grief, and each hour of tortured mourning. Because pain is better than his grinding presence. Pain is better than the knowledge that he's ransacking me, taking me bit by bit, heartache by heartache, and sorrow by beautiful sorrow. The writer. Lake Lopez, 